Well, Salim Awais is the communication officer at UNICEF Middle East and North Africa, and he joins me now from Beirut. There have been some quite worrying statistics and analysis around the challenges for children in Lebanon coming out. What are your biggest concerns for young people in Lebanon? Well, as, as you said, Charlotte, first of all is children losing their lives until the moment we have reports of over 160 60 children killed, over than 130 of them just since September 23rd. Uh, and that's really staggering. Uh, out of the 1.2 million people who are uh, on the move, uh, who lost their uh, houses or just escaped their houses, 400,000 are believed to be uh, uh, children. Of course, those numbers, both the casualties and the displaced, is increasing with every evacuation order, with every attack on uh, civilian uh, uh, neighborhoods and civilian infrastructure. And that's, that's really the main um, concern. Of course, with that comes all the, the host of uh, suffering that will uh, face those children, and it is already facing 400,000 of them in terms of lack of access to uh, the basic needs, uh, uh, water, food, shelter, uh, medicine, and, and medical care. All that is really, really uh, a problem now and mm -hmm. will continue to be and escalate as we go. As you say, Salim. As Of all of the terrible genocides that have been committed, the one of the earlier genocides of the 20th century is possibly one of the most horrific and most concealed. In 1915, the Armenian Genocide began, which saw the use of death matches, concentration camps, and murder in the most brutal fashion. An estimated 1.5 million Armenians and approximately quarter of a million Assyrians were murdered by the Ottoman Turkish Empire. Even to this day, it is not hard to uncover human bone fragments in the Syrian deserts, where thousands were slaughtered. Very few countries acknowledge that the genocide even took place, as to do so invites issues with the Turkish government. In this video today, we will discuss just how so many people could be executed and how it happened. Although the genocide started in 1915, it is important to understand the role of the Armenian people in the Ottoman Empire. Under Ottoman rule, various religious minorities were organized into millets. These were relatively autonomous regions that had some self-governance within their own communities. The majority Sunni Muslim rule created various millets for Shia Muslims, Jews and Christians, namely for Armenian Christians. These millets would pay taxes, often higher than Turkish members of the empire. But there was relative peace between the Turkish majority and the various minority groups, despite those in the millets being second-class citizens. Despite this, many Armenians were able to become well-educated and were overrepresented in professions such as banking, law and medicine. In the late 19th century, the three major Christian powers of Great Britain, France and Russia raised concerns about the unequal treatment in the empire of the Armenian Christians. Following the Russian victory in the Russo-Turkish War of 1877, the Armenian question was raised during the subsequent peace treaty in Berlin. The Balkan states were taken from the Ottoman Empire. Around the same time, Rebellions in Northern Africa caused loss of territory. The Armenian nationalists believed that they too could form their own state. It was believed by the now largely Turkish Ottoman Empire that the inclusive nature of the empire had only caused its decline. Forced assimilation of the remaining minorities in a process called Turkification 
failed to produce the desired results. There were growing fears that the Armenians were working with the Russians, that, combined with a growing Armenian nationalism, resulted in more deadly methods being employed to answer the Armenian question. Between 1894 and 1896, a series of massacres were carried out against the minority populations. Named the Hamidian Massacres, after the Sultan Abdul Hamid II, anywhere between 100,000 and 300,000 Armenians and a further estimated 25,000 Assyrians were murdered. The massacres were carried out by the Hamidii, light cavalry regiments who were designed to patrol the Ottoman borders with Eastern Europe. These Hamidii units and the state-backed Kurdish nomadic bandits were given free rein to harass the Armenian people. Before too long, the Armenians began to fight back, although this only gave justification for an escalation in attacks. In response, the Turkish populations were whipped up into a frenzy by their religious and political leaders. Able to show this as an example as to how the Armenians were looking to destroy the Muslim way of life. As a result, pogroms erupted around the Ottoman Empire. The deadliest massacre took place in Yurfa, where the cathedral was razed to the ground, or whilst 3,000 Armenians were inside seeking refuge. Those who tried to escape were shot. Those who were not directly slaughtered died from starvation as refugees. An American journalist named William Sachtelben witnessed the aftermath of a pogrom against the Armenians, and he wrote, Along the wall to the north, in a row 20 foot wide and 150 foot long, lay the dead bodies of 321 massacred Armenians. Many were fearful, mangled and mutilated. I saw one with his face completely smashed in with a blow of some heavy weapon after he was killed. I saw some of their own necks almost severed by a sword cut. One I saw, whose whole chest had been skinned, his forearms were cut off, while the upper arm was skinned of flesh. I asked if the dogs had done this. I was told no. The Turks did it with their knives. By 1897, the Sultan was content that the risk of the Armenian nationalism had faded, with many of the intellectuals and nationalists either dead or fleeing into Eastern Europe, though the worst was yet to come for the remaining Armenians. In 1908, the Committee of Union and Progress, or the CUP, had taken control of the Ottoman Empire following the revolution of the Young Turks. The leaders were pro-Turkish nationalists and wished to create a Turkish nation in Anatolia. Direction of this push for a Turkish nation was led by the three Pashas. The Grand Vizier Talat Pasha, Minister of the Interior Enver Pasha and the Minister of War Ahmed Pasha. But another military defeat in the 1912 Balkan War resulted in the loss of the remainder of Ottoman-held Eastern Europe, with 850,000 Balkan Muslims forced into the Ottoman Empire. Matters were looking dire for the new rulers. This defeat contradicted their claims of Turkish superiority, and so another reason for the defeat was needed. Talat Pasha and Enver Pasha both indicated that there was an internal tumour, referring to the Armenians. With the onset of World War I in 1914, the Ottomans sought to regain land lost in Eastern Europe and North Africa. Allying with Germany against Russia and Great Britain, the Ottoman Empire sought to push the narrative of Turkish supremacy. The war would later prove a cover for the final answer to the Armenian question. Fighting on multiple fronts, the Ottomans attempted to encourage Armenians in Russian territory to rise up and rebel, in exchange for an Armenian homeland. 
This offer was rejected, with the Russian and Ottoman Armenians swearing loyalty to their own state. This was seen by the Ottomans as a snub, and one that would only fuel suspicion of Armenian and Russian collusion. At the Battle of Sari Kamash, the Ottoman forces faced their biggest defeat against the Russian army. The army contained Russian Armenian soldiers. The Ottoman army did contain Armenian volunteers, but the suspicion still fell on them as the cause for the loss. A fifth column undermining the war effort. Armenian soldiers were disarmed and sent to labor battalions, no longer trusted. Once they were disarmed, the Armenian soldiers were systematically murdered by their former brothers in arms. But the turning point was at the Armenian occupation of their holy city of Van and the defense against Ottoman forces. The Turks viewed this as definitive evidence of an Armenian revolution with Russian backing. However, the Armenians barricading themselves in Van was in response to fear of wholesale murder of Armenians in the area. Some 50,000 Armenians were slaughtered in the outlying provinces, with the blame placed on the Turkish-backed Kurdish militias linked to the Hamidii. It is important to note that the Turkish Gendarmerie, the Turkish military police, were also to blame. Regardless, the Pashas had all the proof they needed to finally answer the Armenian question. In a mirror to the expulsion of 850,000 Balkan Muslims, the Pashas organized the mass deportations of the Armenians, Greeks and Assyrians within their borders. Deportations started in Constantinople, targeting the political and intellectual elites and spread around the empire, with networks of routes leading to holding camps. It did not matter whether these were loyal or potentially disloyal, all the Armenians were targeted and deemed a threat to national security. The deportations were carried out through the use of death marches. Able-bodied men and boys over the age of 12 would be executed, very often in front of their loved ones. Bodies were usually disposed of in rivers, but due to the vast numbers of bodies clogging the water and the pollution caused, this was stopped and instead the bodies were dumped into cave systems or gorges. It is reported that at one time there were so many corpses in the river that in order to clear the obstructions, explosives had to be used. The women, children and the elderly were marched into the Syrian desert, namely to Diel el Zor. Thousands died on the way, either due to the harsh conditions or the harsher treatment of their Turkish and Kurdish captors. Reports of sexual assault were commonplace, as were summary executions. Bodies left littering the way. On arrival at Deir el Zor, the few that survived were left with no supplies to die an arduous death in the middle of the desert. It is estimated that 150,000 people died in the desert of Deir el Zor. One survivor to such a march was Kanum Palutian. 21 years old at the time, with the Turkish forces arriving in her village. Everything of value was taken, food, money and animals. She saw her stepfather beheaded as he prayed for mercy along with the rest of the boys and men. The rest were forced to march into the mountains, feet bleeding all the way. At the sight of water, the captives would try to drink what they could before John de Murray escorts would beat them away. She witnessed women and girls being taken away to be sexually assaulted, never to be seen again. Kurnum avoided this fate by smearing her face with mud and pretending to be disabled. Anyone who tried to leave the convoy was killed immediately. All in all, Kurnum's family were killed. Her mother, father, sister and brother who was barely 10 years old 
were left as unburied corpses along mountains, gorges and fields of the Death March. At Razaleyan, around 80,000 Armenians would be murdered. Razaleyan was a gathering point for various convoys of Armenians. More often than not, the women and children would arrive naked having had all of their possessions taken from them by the Jandamore and Kurdish militias. In the desert, they would languish in camps suffering from starvation and rampant illness. Periodically, groups of hundreds at a time were taken into the desert. Victims would be clubbed, shot or burned to death. You will note from the map on screen that some of the arrows end in the middle of the Black Sea. This refers to the boatloads of people shipped out into the middle of the sea where they would be forced into the water and left to drown. It is estimated that 50,000 people met their end this way. Even amongst all of the horror, there were those that fought against the genocide and attempted to save whoever they could. It is important to note the role of the settled Kurdish villages, Bedouin nomads and Arab villages who risked their lives to save as many as they could. Often children would be sent away from their relatives with such people in hopes they would survive. Parents would often make the impossible choice between a son or a daughter, often picking a son so that the family line could continue. There were some in positions of power who were able to assist those, notably Fidel Alboud, the mayor of Deir el Zor. He was able to provide some food and shelter to those who were sent to die. Of the two million Armenians who lived in the Ottoman Empire, only 400,000 were left after the deportations and executions. The Ottoman Empire collapsed following its defeat in World War I, and the three Pashas fled to avoid prosecution for their crimes. At subsequent military tribunals, the CUP leadership were found guilty of various war crimes and sentenced to death, though this was in absentia. Talat Pasha was assassinated in Germany in 1921 by an Armenian who was ultimately found not guilty due to the trauma caused by his experiences of the genocide. Enver Pasha was killed in combat against the Russian Red Army by forces under the command of a Russian Armenian. Ahmed Pasha was assassinated in 1922 while working in Afghanistan, again by Armenians seeking vengeance. To this day, few countries will acknowledge the Armenian Genocide. To do so, will damage relations with Turkey. The Turkish position is that whilst the necessary deportations did take place for national security reasons, there was no intention to exterminate the Armenian people. Those who persist to claim that the Turks committed a genocide can face prosecution or worse. Hrant Dink was a Turkish Armenian journalist who was prosecuted three times for denigrating Turkishness. He was then assassinated by a Turkish nationalist in the middle of the street. This has not deterred historians such as Helal Bertke who pushes for greater acceptance that the genocide happened. He even uncovered that in the 80s, the Turkish government shredded documents relating to the genocide in the bid to hide the truth. In terms of international recognition, it is varied and largely political. The Kurdish Democratic Party have apologised for the role of the Kurdish tribes in the genocide. It was only in 2021 that a sitting President of the United States publicly referred to the events of 1915 as a genocide. European countries such as France and Germany have acknowledged that the genocide took place, whilst the United Kingdom has not, but the devolved nations of Wales and Scotland have. It is a very mixed bag as to which countries acknowledge the genocide. I would invite you all to take the time to listen and read to the accounts of those who were able to witness what took place. Accounts by survivors and foreign officials 
will be found linked in the description below. In Armenia, there is a memorial to those who perished, known as the Eternal Flame. Thousands of people lay flowers to pay their respects in what becomes known as the Wall of Flowers. The scapegoating of a minority is a tale that repeats itself all too often in our collective human history. The horrors of the Armenian Genocide were repeated throughout the 20th century, often against minorities in a similar social standing as the Armenians in the Ottoman Empire. One hopes that in remembering the Armenian Genocide, we can be one step closer to avoiding yet another recurrence of such horrors. Who brought so much filth to our cultures? Pornography, a corrupt legal system, corrupt laws, not God's laws. Who owns and controls the hospitals and all the pharmaceutical companies that demand the masses take this, take that, and oh, by the way, you better bring your children to get this and or that, or we can't let them in school. Speaking of schools, who writes the textbooks and has for over 60 years, for over 60 years, written our textbooks with some of the greatest lies ever taught? And this is how the young people, this is how they are formed with the textbooks. Why would somebody want to have control over that? Because you can control the future people that come along. You can start the lies. You can plant the seeds at a very young age. Who removed prayer from schools in 1963, Shemp v. New York, because it was offensive to them? Who would find prayer offensive to them? Who would hate Jesus Christ that praying in Jesus' name would be so offensive to them that they could not hear it? Maybe the people that murdered him. Maybe the people that he condemned would find it so offensive we don't want to hear his name. Who brought you Hollywood and the vile and corrupt media? Who brought you the abominations about gender? And who has destroyed the economy and practices usury? Who formed the Federal Reserve in 1913? Why has every federal chairman, so-called federal chairman, of the Federal Reserve been Jewish? Why not Christian? Why not Hindu, Buddhist? Why not atheist? Why not anything? Why do they always have to be Jewish? Why? I'm asking you. Who openly mocks and hates Jesus? Who brought tens of millions of people to your shores to alter your nation forever? Who has infiltrated the churches and demanded the devil's children be worshipped, thus denying the Father and Jesus? Who constantly says they're the victim when they are guilty of the crimes they accuse others of? We live in a time when all we hear is we're all equal. The politicians and media shouts treat everybody the same. The leader of this movement is the synagogue of Satan, yet the so-called liberals, activists, and churches in America are seeing a massacre and starvation in Gaza of the Palestinian people, and they dare not say anything except we support Israel. Who knows more? The people called Jews, liberals, Sean Hannity, Donald Trump, professors, Doctors, preachers, gurus, or God Almighty. I mean, who knows more? Who murdered Jesus? Who did Jehovah condemn? Who did Jesus call the children of the devil? Israel has the most brutal, undisciplined, unprincipled military probably in the entire world. And it has been demonstrated by their repeated killing of civilians, aid workers, women, children, and without any regard, they will attack and will destroy hospitals, schools, members of the press. They will do it. And they get away with labeling all that oppose them as terrorists. So if you see their brutal treatment of people and you speak out you're a terrorist, surely Nobody in their right mind would think this is a people of God. Who would think this would be God's chosen? Jesus Christ says, he that is of God doeth the will of God. Do you believe they're doing the will of God? Have they ever done the will of God Almighty, Jehovah Father? The Bible tells us twice the Jews murdered Jesus. Twice.
they started this talk about terrorism back in the 90s that if you speak out if you're if you speak out against the system the government if you speak out against them of course you are a terrorist this started back in Oklahoma City in 1995 with the false flag in Oklahoma City and of course they were a couple of white guys you see this is how they do it you have to control the narrative and you have to make anybody that speaks out as bad they did the same thing to Jesus in fact they told Jesus you have a devil in you and Jesus told him, I don't have a devil in me, but I do honor my father, and you dishonor my father. Everybody's a terrorist if they speak out against Israel. So be it. I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus. So I tell the state of Israel, the Jews, the synagogue of Satan, liberals, politicians, doctors, media, academia, Google, you top that. When you have more power than Jesus Christ, you get back with me. Jesus has all power and no fear. That's who I walk with. That's who I live with. That's my best friend. And his father is the boss of all bosses. Interestingly, most of you know that communism came from the synagogue of Satan. This is exactly the habit of the Soviets back in the old days of the USSR. Anyone who speaks out is an enemy of the state. It may work in their world but it's irrelevant in the fathers and Jesus' children. Israel is going to escalate us into a World War III in the United States. The animal that the state of Israel rides, the wild beast that it rides, until the beast is no more because that beast is growing weaker and weaker and weaker, and they're starting to know it. The United States is not the powerhouse that it was just 30 years ago. A lot has changed. Our Father in Jesus loves us very much. We do not know the depth of their love. Rest assured, we do not love them nearly anywhere as much as they love us. How could we? They're perfect. We are not. Their love is perfect. Our love is not perfect. Even when we love them a lot, it's nothing compared to what they feel for us. Jesus will always come and get you. Your Father in Jesus will always say, we've got one and they know you by name because Jesus says, I call you by name. Jesus knows your name. The Bible says that the hairs of, of your head are numbered. You may not have many, but hey, you know what? The Father knows how many is there. We live in a time when most people do not know the Father or Jesus. They do not know the Father, and if you don't know the Father, you don't know Jesus. People do not pray to God. They do not speak with Jesus. They, do, they don't care. If you know the Father and Jesus, you will love them, and if you love them, you will talk to them. And this is prayer. And you'll do it often. Sometimes you'll have deep, long talks and sometimes short talks with just a few words, but you pray. The prayer, the love, the trust is the same. You see, it's all about the talk. It's the, com it's the words that we have with our Father. You asking your Father in Jesus' name to help you as you walk the last mile of your lives in the most trying times that are, have ever come and are going to come upon this earth. And what we're seeing now, folks, is nothing compared to what's coming. Prayer is your greatest weapon. It is your water. It is your food. It is your shelter. It is your lights. It is your heat on a cold night. It's your guidance. It's your weapon. It's your navigation. It's where to go and when not to go. It's everything. It's your counsel. It's for those who know the perfect things of the Father who will say, I'll always take care of you. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. James 5, 16 says, Confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You see, folks, I want to say something to you as we close about censorship. I don't like certain people. Uh, I don't like their comments. I block them. I deny them. I'm not going to have people coming to my channel bashing Jesus Christ or spewing lies. That's not censorship. Real censorship is when we censor ourselves out of fear. This is the true meaning of censorship. That you're afraid to tell the truth because you're going to offend someone. And sometimes the truth of God is going to offend everybody. My friends, it's the denial of Jesus that will get you. You see, it's the mockery of Jesus that's going to get you. It's the life of mocking God and what he gave us in Jesus. That's going to get you. 
Because when you censor yourself and say you're willing to deny Jesus Christ to be a part of this world, to go along, to get along, that's censorship. So when somebody tells you, hey, you know, you shouldn't be censoring me, you don't know what censorship is. Censorship is when you censor yourself. When you're not willing to say the truth that is of the Father and who? What is his name? Jesus. When we pray, we keep ourselves close to our Father and Jesus. It's always us reaffirming our love and our bond we have with our mighty Father through Jesus. Self-censorship is when folks become too afraid to say the name Jesus. Self-censorship is when folks become too afraid to admit that Jesus is the only way. And even if they really believe it, they are in fear. They don't want to offend other folks or they just want to fit in. To hell with fitting in. Yet they do not care about offending God, which is the only thing that matters. Imagine that. Folks don't want to offend other people, but they don't care that they offend God. Your father is what matters. Nothing else matters, man. Friends, as we see these things unfolding, we must pray and we must keep praying. What a mighty and loving father we have in the glorious image he gave us in his beloved son, Jesus. Prayer is our words. Prayer is our talking with our Father and Jesus. Prayer is private. It's personal. And it's a deep way of staying close to what matters, your Father and Jesus Christ. Friends, this life is not about anything but our Father and Jesus. Jesus told us what's the most important thing to do in this world. What matters most in this life? Loving your Father with, your, with everything in you, your heart, soul, and mind. Loving God first. And when you love God first, what will you do next? You'll love Jesus. We're going to see really bad times come upon this earth. And your way to deal with this is prayer. Ask for what you need. You do all things and you ask for all things in the name that is above all names. The most beautiful of, the most beautiful of all names is one name. The name that is the most powerful. The name that the Father said, it's more precious than my own because the Father loves his son so much. His name is Jesus. I thank you for watching in Jesus' name. Amen.